buried alive by three armed hijackers, their harrowing story made headlines across the country. Here's what really happened during this infamous day of terror. On July 15, 1976, 26 summer school students from Dairyland Elementary in Chowchilla, California went swimming at the local pool to cool off. Afterwards, they took the bus home. It was such a short trip that some of them hadn't even bothered to change out of their bathing suits. Bus driver Ed Ray was driving them home when he noticed a van in the way at the side of the road and tried to maneuver the bus around it, but it was a trap. Three men wearing pantyhose over their heads as masks and wielding sawed-off shotguns forced Ray and the children out of the bus. One of the children, Larry Park, later told 48 Hours that the masks were terrifying. Where their eyes were, it almost looked hollow. It was like looking at death. Park told KCRA-TV that the kidnappers took down their names and ages and then confiscated everyone's pants and shoes. Ray and the kids were then forced to jump into the back of two windowless vans. The bus was abandoned in a nearby riverbed, and the kidnappers drove off with Ray and the terrified children. The disappearance of an entire busload of children sent the entire city into fear and confusion. As one worried mother told Fox 11 Los Angeles at the time, it was like somebody came down from Mars and just took them up off the planet. Where are the children? The incident became worldwide news as authorities tried to find the children. Sheriff Ed Bates, now retired, later told the Nightmare and Chowchilla podcast he thought that a parent might have stopped the bus to pick up their child early. Rumors swirled that a parent was involved in the abduction or that it was politically motivated. Parents and other citizens joined with the police and FBI to scour the area for any trace of the kids. But nothing could be found. The reason nobody could find them anywhere near Chowchilla is because they weren't anywhere near Chowchilla. Once inside the vans, the 27 kidnapping victims were forced to endure a suffocating 12-hour ride. The windows of the vans had been painted over so no one could tell where they were headed, and there were no opportunities for bathroom breaks or even a chance to breathe fresh air. Jennifer Brown Hyde later told WCBI that she remembered trying to comfort the younger children who had begun crying. She said, didn't know where we were going didn't know what they were going to do with us. We drove for what seemed like hours upon hours upon hours. Ultimately, the kidnappers drove their victims to Livermore, California, which would have been less than a two-hour drive from Chowchilla if they had gone straight there instead of driving around for hours to throw searchers off the trail. The final destination was a rock quarry where a moving van had been buried underground as a holding cell for the victims. According to Vox, the kids were told to take a flashlight and climb down into the makeshift prison. Inside, there were crude toilets carved out, mattresses to sit on, and ventilation pipes that made it possible to just barely breathe from 12 feet underground. There was water and some food, bread, cereal, and peanut butter, but according to KCRA-TV, the scant supplies were hardly enough to sustain the captives for long, and the heat was unbearable. In an interview with CNN, survivor Linda Lavendera remembered the bunker being like a coffin, and there was constant, inconsolable crying. Larry Park was six years old when he found himself surrounded by a darkness he thought might engulf him forever. He told the Nightmare in Chowchilla podcast, The screaming to this day is buried in the audio files of my memory. The perpetrators had done everything to make sure no escape was possible. According to KCRA-TV, they had snatched away the ladder after the last of the victims made their way down, and the bunker was weighed down with plywood, steel, dirt, and heavy truck batteries to keep them from breaking out. Those precautions nearly killed the children. Survivor Mike Marshall remembered on the Nightmare in Chowchilla podcast that amidst the screaming and praying, one of the other children began kicking a support post that was holding up the ceiling of the buried trailer. Suddenly, the roof caved in at one end, crushing one of the air vents. Larry Park told CBS, I knew that I was going to die. But amidst the screaming, the collapse also gave the trapped victims desperate hope. Ray and Marshall, who was 14 at the time, realized that this was their chance. Assisted by some of the older children, they stacked mattresses to reach the top of the trailer, then spent hours working to pry the door open and dig themselves out. And all the kids are cheering me on, you know, come on, Mike, you can do it, you can do it. 16 hours after being buried alive, the victims escaped, all still alive. Larry Park said of Mike Marshall on the Nightmare in Chowchilla podcast, Mike was Hercules, Mike was Samson, Mike was the man that slayed the beast. So why did the kidnappers do it? For money. Frederick Woods and brothers James and Richard Schoenfeld were all 20-somethings born into wealth, but they had gotten themselves into a lot of debt. The fastest money grab they could think of was a ransom. According to Vox, they targeted children because missing kids tend to trigger the most desperation. Assistant District Attorney Jill Kling told CBS, This crime was planned out for a year and a half in intricate detail. The trio planned to demand $5 million in ransom, which they thought the state of California would pay to get the kids back. According to the New York Times, the plan was also inspired in part by an infamous scene in the 1971 movie Dirty Harry, where a school bus is hijacked by a serial killer who then flees to a quarry. 
Ironically, though, they never got to deliver the ransom demand. When they tried to call the Chowchilla Police Department, they couldn't get through because the phone lines were tied up by all the concerned parents calling for answers. After he and his accomplices found out that 27 victims had somehow broken out of the bunker, Woods hightailed it to Canada and waited for the others to catch up. They never made it. Rick Schoenfeld turned himself in eight days after the kidnapping, while Woods and James Schoenfeld were both captured by law enforcement after two weeks on the lam. While in Canada, Woods wrote to a screenwriter friend, suggesting that the kidnapping would make a great movie. Woods, it turned out, had hoped to use some of the ransom money to become a movie producer. The letter was later used against him in court. Ultimately, there was actually a movie made about the Chowchilla kidnappings. Vanished Without a Trace, which came out in 1993, stars Carl Malden as Ed Ray, with Tim Ransom, Travis Fine, and Tom Hodges as the perpetrators. It wasn't a hit. The three kidnappers were charged with kidnapping for ransom and robbery, as well as infliction of bodily harm. All three pleaded guilty to the kidnapping charges, but not to the charge of infliction of bodily harm, as that would have led to mandatory life sentences without parole. The prosecution was faced with a tricky task. In the 1970s, mental trauma inflicted by a crime was not taken as seriously as physical trauma, but there was little physical harm that could be proven. One of the prosecutors told KCRA-TV that when it came to the prosecution, everything had to be on a psychological basis. All three were initially found guilty and sentenced to life without parole. However, the sentence was overturned on appeal, as the appellate court decided the injuries did not meet the legal criteria of bodily harm. As a result, the sentences were changed to life in prison, but with the possibility of future parole. The lack of understanding about mental health extended beyond the legal system. As most of the children were physically unharmed, the only treatment they received in the aftermath was minimal counseling. A 1979 study published by psychiatrist Lenore Turr in the American Journal of Psychiatry found that the children all suffered from post-traumatic stress. The trauma manifested in many ways, including a pessimistic outlook, nightmares, panic attacks, hallucinations, personality changes, and other fears that were directly linked to the kidnapping. Symptoms were found to be similar regardless of how old the children were when they were abducted, and the trauma persisted. Turr re-evaluated the children in 1981 and again in 1983, and found that, quote, every child exhibited post-traumatic effects. For example, according to a 1982 Washington Post article, she noticed some of the children would play burying Barbie and reenact what happened to them in other ways, even several years later. For many of the children, Turr's studies were the most therapy they received, leading some of the parents of the affected children to call her an angel. Linda Labandera was in the fourth grade when she was buried alive along with 26 other victims. She told CNN that since the abduction, she had tried to keep herself from sleeping too deeply so she could avoid recurring nightmares of choking on the stale hot air in the dark, filthy underground prison she was trapped in. Some survivors turned to drugs and alcohol later in life. Jennifer Brown Hyde's brother, who survived the kidnapping with her, died in a tragic accident shortly after. Hyde told 48 Hours that the double trauma was scarring. I was an angry individual. I was an absolute mess. I made a lot of bad choices in life after that. I told Fox News that she thought she would literally die in the bunker. And even now, when she gets a tornado warning, she finds it difficult to hide in her crawl space because it reminds her too much of being buried alive. Mike Marshall, who was a dauntless demon slayer in the eyes of Larry Park, is now in his 60s. Fox 11 reports that he still lives with his mother and has an emotional support animal with him at all times. And Larry Park went through such severe trauma that, according to ABC, he suffered from schizophrenia and addiction most of his life. Park eventually came to terms with what happened. He wrote in his book, The Chowchilla Kidnapping, Why Me?, that after being haunted by the three kidnappers for years, he decided he needed to face them by attending a parole hearing to protest their release. He wrote, I've always been afraid of these demons, and whenever I've tried not to be afraid of them, they have visited me in my dreams, making me relive the torture of abduction. However, something unexpected happened. He ended up forgiving each of his captors in person and pushed to have them granted parole. He told Fox 26 that although he still faces fears of darkness and crowded areas, he found his experience at the parole hearings to be cathartic. Since I have found the freedom of forgiveness, I know that I am a better person. Not everyone feels the same way, though. Richard Schoenfeld was freed from prison in 2012 at the age of 57. James Schoenfeld was released in 2015 at the age of 63. And mastermind Fred Woods was finally paroled in 2022 at the age of 70. The fact that they were released at all has been a bitter pill for many of the surviving victims who have suffered a lifetime of trauma from the experience. 
Survivor Jody Huffington told NBC LA that she remembered being 10 years old and looking down the barrel of one of the sawed-off shotguns that was pointed right at her face. She said that releasing the kidnappers was a definite slap in the face. And Linda Labandera, who was nine at the time of the kidnapping, had a similar reaction when the court granted James Schoenfeld parole. As she told KFSN, when she found out, she was nauseous and then very tearful. For the victims, the trauma of that terrible day will never be completely over.